So <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you about data and disruption and the power of the individual that's emerging in society and, what, and how we're going to, um, how we can actually have a better experience living through the world over the, next, uh, over the next few years. But it starts off with where we are now, which is that I think we're in a little bit of chaos. Um, we have so much information coming at us from so many areas and there's so many expectations of us, whether it be on social media or how we dress, how we look, etc., that there's a lot of confusion and it's, uh, it's a confusion that's affecting different generations in different ways. Um, whether it be interpersonal relations, um, I mean, is this, is this people hanging out if they're not even looking at each other? We have, uh, we're communicating in an ever-evolving language that doesn't even make sense to half the people that read it. Um, and it leaves a lot to interpretation. So when you, when you send a message and you end it with one of these, you're supposed to convey an emotion. But if we know that over 90% of emotion is conveyed through your, through your physique, the way that you, the way that you see people, is um, are we really saying what we want to say? Um, I don't need to go much into politics, but I think that we know that the political scene is getting a little outrageous, and it's becoming more about entertainment and shock value than it is about substance. There's confusion in business, because the boundaries between the digital and the physical, and how we should regulate, and what's what's real and what's fake and what's great and what's not great um, are, being, are being really, con it's confusing now. And entire industries are getting disrupted and it happens overnight. Um, the thing is that we're totally overwhelmed, but a lot of people aren't really showing it. We're not really uh, being honest about how this is affecting us. In fact, we're doing the exact opposite. We're posting the most absurd nonsense uh, and, and telling the world that our lives are absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, and, and I don't think everybody really knows what to make of what's going on uh, today. So I could talk to you about how artificial intelligence is going to build an intellect that's super smart and it's going to interact with every part of our lives and it's going to make every one of our problems disappear or how uh, we're headed down a path where armies of robots are going to come and augment our lives and we're not going to have to worry about interacting anymore. Um, but first of all, I'm not the science fiction writer, and it's, uh, it's Friday, and I lost those slides. Anyway, so um, I'm just going to talk about uh, three major things, and hopefully they'll be a little bit more positive. Um, the first is I want to I give my perspective. There's uh, some seats right up here. Um, I want to give my perspective on how data and technology are affecting us today as individuals and where I think we're headed as individuals and, uh, and businesses. And I want to share my vision for how, or my view, on how technology uh, is empowering us and contributes to our lives. Sometimes it affects us in what you could call negative ways, and sometimes it could be seen as positive. My goal is just to put it out there and uh, let it be something for people to debate. And your role is to just sit back and reflect and think about it and see, you know, given all these different viewpoints, how's, how is technology and data affecting me and how am I letting it uh, how am I letting it consume me, and how am I letting it drive me? Um, so before I get into the depths, just a couple of things to think about. So firstly, never in history have we as human beings been asked to consume and digest this much data. Uh, people rely on their cell phones, email, digital assistants to gather and transmit all kinds of data every single day. We have to deliver um, value at work while dealing with work emails, um, personal calls, Facebook messages, messages from your girlfriend, uh, pick this up before I come home, I have to go to the dentist, and somebody posts something on my, on my Facebook, and I have to decide whether I like it or not, and whether I should take it down. So we're always connected, and we're, expecting, we're expected to always be on and always be available. And so we're dealing with a world where these are the biggest fears of our generation. Um, we panic when there's no Wi-Fi, or something loads too slowly, or if our phone's going to die. Um, and this, I mean, I took this screenshot on my phone last month. I freaked out when I called an Uber in Toronto and there was none available. I did, I, 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 for a moment, I didn't know that I could go outside and ask a taxi to take me somewhere. Um, I, I just become so reliant on, on Uber. And what that's a sign of is that, you know, we're just, we're overstimulated. There's just so much coming at us and our ability to make heads or tails of it sometimes is, um, is something that we need to work on. And 
it's not going to get better because most of us don't even take advantage yet of all the wearables and all the devices and all the Internet of Things that we'll talk about later. Um, but all of these devices are ramping up and they're creating a whole bunch of data and we're supposed to care about it. Um, if you think about uh, your, your Fitbit, I wear a Fitbit, so I care how many steps I do and I compete with my friends and always at the back of my mind is how many steps am I taking? And, I'm, and am I going to do more than my father? And it annoys me when he does more than I do. And, um, and it leads to some other things that uh, are a little bit more serious and are affecting our society, which is technology-addicted children. It may seem far-fetched, but there are real institutes to help kids get over addiction to technology. Um, so we've gone really, really far uh, into, one, into one direction. And the people who are supposed to help coach their children through this are parents who are also overstimulated and coming home from work, and all they want to do is try and find a way to disconnect, but they may not know how to. So my thought is that the world has always had ebbs and flows. Everything comes and goes. It goes in one direction, swings back the other. And I would contend that over the past 50 years, we've gone through cycles of simplicity to complexity to simplicity again. Um, but I think that technology, enhanced by the internet and data that we have available to us, um, which has brought us into the chaos that we're in right now, will also help us emerge. And I think that, it's gonna, that we're going to emerge because we're going to have a much more tech-savvy population that grows up with this and, and, is, and is accustomed to it being a part of their, their everyday lives. I think, I think that there is a bright future ahead that we will, we will emerge from this chaos. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to you about today is, um, is how technology has, has changed us. Um, the business world is changing. People are trying to adapt. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a focus on banking, which may be a shameless plug to, uh, to the National Bank. Um, but uh, I'll attempt to just summarize everything that's going on and leave you with something that's hopefully uh, a little bit, a um, little actionable, or uh, at least you'll have showed up and had an expensive lunch um, and hung out with a guy who tried to entertain you a little bit. So, um, but I, I do want to start with this, though. Um, I need, <laughs> I usually do pretty okay. Um, we'll see how we, uh, we'll see how we roll. Okay. So the first part here, so how technology has changed the way you interact. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history of the entire world. Um, we used to interact like this. Family dinners, concerts, this is how we read newspapers. Um, it was very person to person, and it was about living in the moment at that time. And we captured events in a very imperfect manner, but we aggregated it all, and at uh, parties or dinners, we would sit and we'd review them. And we'd talk about the things that were meaningful to us at that time. And uh, getting together with friends was about getting together with friends. Um, we focused, we, we engaged in the moment, and we communicated in person. Or uh, sometimes things took a little bit longer. If you had a friend that had a 9 or a 0 in their phone number, you probably didn't want to call them. Um, but we communicated, um, and time passed, and things started to evolve. Things evolved quickly. In 1963, Polaroid invented the first color instant film camera. And this was a big moment, because it set the expectation for real time. Real time gratification. I want to take a picture, I want to see it right away, and I was able to. And then, um, this is the guy who invented the cell phone. We had, uh, we had the first cell phones. We were able to take our conversations on the go. We didn't have to be home anymore. And this set the expectation that we could be late for things, because we could call and say, I'm not going to be there. Um, for most people, the 80s looked like this, while for some, this is what it looked like, and they were building the future for us. And things started to change pretty quickly. We went from texting like this to texting like this. And you had to be really sure you wanted to text somebody that had a PQRS in their, number, in their name because you had to hit seven four times. Um, and then we started to invent words. A new vocabulary came because along came the internet and the concept of emailing and messaging and browsing. If anybody remembers Netscape, there were these wars. Um, and a whole new culture started to develop. But we did it in an imperfect way because we had dial-up. And I'm sure people can remember what the modem sounded like. I, can, I know the exact sound that my 24-4 mod, mod modem made. 
Um, but it was the beginning of being able to communicate efficiently and send messages around the world. Um, but we're still mostly disconnected at the time. We read, we had uh, anti-skip CDs, um, but we took, we took pictures on disposable cameras. And the thing about the disposable cameras was the pictures may have been imperfect, but we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that each one was as good as we could get it. Sometimes it would be overexposed. But then things started to change again. We had the digital camera. And with the digital camera, we could take as many pictures as we want. We could make mistakes. The individual moment became a little bit less important. And we could edit reality, which meant that sometimes our pictures looked a lot better than what reality was. And we started emailing and texting. The BlackBerry came out. It was mostly for business, but it was a big, drastic change. Um, we were able to communicate a full-length message on the go while driving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, meanwhile, the web continued to evolve. All of these things started to change and grow. One of the most important ones there is the cookie. We can talk about it. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. But what the web brought to us was the rise of the individual and collective voice. So whether it be YouTube, where Justin Bieber got his start, or reviews on social media, um, sharing opinions on topics started to become the norm. And one of the biggest, most important things that happened, which uh, is something that we'll also talk a little bit about later, was the concept of ratings. We now rate everything. You go on Amazon, you rate what you bought. You buy a car, you rate your car. And so what became more important than, com than companies telling us if their products were good or not was what our peers and our friends told us was good and important. And, we would, and, we'd, and companies' reputations could be completely changed overnight. And it, because opinions had the ability to shift people's, uh, people's feelings. Um, one of the most impressive realizations of user-generated content and a collective of individuals coming together is Wikipedia. It's the largest and most popular online general reference encyclopedia that anyone can edit. There's no, there is no ability for any entity ever to have created something like Wikipedia. This is about the individuals coming together to create something. And, and Wikipedia was an example of empowering individuals to build something bigger than themselves. And politicians took note because leaders um, wanted to empower individuals too. Now, they may have leveraged the individual's desire to feel empowered, but they took advantage of the fact that people wanted to have a voice. And uh, the internet allowed for crowdfunding. Obama's campaign was fully crowdfunded or majority crowdfunded. It meant that each individual felt like they owned a little piece of his success. And that was a very, very big deal. So the web is changing the way uh, people and institutions interact. We could talk about a whole history of why, and I obviously didn't cover everything. Um, but there are a few topics that I think have major influence in the way we're interacting today. One of them is social platforms. Um, next one is collaboration tools. Then there's the cloud. And then there's mobile. So social platforms, they redefine how we meet people, how we build and maintain relationships, and how we communicate with massive, massive numbers. A third of the planet uses these platforms on a regular basis. That's a very, very big deal. Majority of individuals look at Facebook the first thing when they wake up in the morning. 50%, um, 150%, sorry. The number of SMS messages that are sent around the world is actually doubled um, with WhatsApp. That's a social platform. So this guy, this guy promised that he was going to connect us, and he succeeded. We see our friends in real time. We see what they do. They see what we're doing. We share experiences. We maintain relationships. Um, within a few seconds of having opened Facebook, you can see a friend who went skydiving. You can see what he commented on. You can post a picture. You can message him, you can catch up, and you can say, OK, I'm going to call you later. Um, that's convenience, that's your friendliness. And now we use Facebook to organize social events, um, organize strikes. You see a lot of those around here. Uh, fundraisers, uh, we have group chats. And um, we use Messenger, Facebook Messenger, just like any other platform. And collaboration tools have completely changed the way we work together. You can have people in different locations around the world working on a presentation, updating it in real time while video conferencing. And hopefully, they will back theirs up. 
Um, but for students, as much as employees, this is a game changer. This is a real game changer. There's also next generation email and collaboration. Slack um, was just valued at over $3 billion. Um, it's an efficient way for people to store their interactions, their email, and their communications all in one place. And it's simple, it's user friendly, and it's productive, and it's really inexpensive. And then there's the cloud. So from corporate clouds like, uh, and private clouds, like you have Office 365 and you have Google Apps and CRM and Dropbox that are lighter versions, the cloud has changed um, in a very impressive way um, our digital lives. There's no more clutter. There's no more stacks of CDs with things stored on them that you have to go try and find and writing on them. All of our data is within, re uh, within reach and with le less risk of losing, although you, you can lose it. So, does anybody know what happened on June 26th, 2007? T uh, 2007? It was one of the days that changed everything. Um, it was the day the iPhone was released. It was the first time that we had true, convenient, simple, and friendly access to all types of communication, browsers, etc., all in one place at one time. And we didn't realize, or a lot of people didn't realize, that this was the beginning of being connected at all time. You are always reachable, and the expectation that you are always reachable began. One of the really, uh, really critical elements of the iPhone was that it gave a camera to everybody. Camera companies went out of business very, very fast. You gave, you gave billions of people the ability to have the ability to take a picture, post it online, and share it with one, 500, a million people instantly. 90% um, of people sleep within arm's reach of their phone. It's their alarm clock. It's everything for them. So what makes the adoption rate of this phone, we had phones before, but what makes it so high? It's this. It's apps. You have sports apps. You have tons of different kinds of apps. So the, the geolocalization, so the sensors and the phones, gave us the ability to determine what the closest restaurant was to us. It gave us maps. They give us transportation, like Uber. When we plan a trip, we can say, all right, I want to stay in this hotel, and I want this rent-a-car, and I want to know all the restaurants that are going to be near me. And you can do it all in the palm of your hand. And so, that, so what really exploded was communication, us wanting to know what's out there, and businesses trying to communicate with us, and all vying for our attention. What's interesting, though, is six out of every 10 apps is a messaging app. That really proves that communication is at the forefront of the majority of the technology investment that's going on um, in the ether out there. So with all the different types of media that we can communicate in, in real time, we can, also, we can choose how and when and why and with whom we communicate. But technology has changed the way that we interact. It's the way we interact with each other, the way we interact with the world. We can fall in love. We can play. We can have relationships and friendships online. But face-to-face -face remains important still for the more emotional and important deep interactions. Um, but technology is bringing us closer. Take Skype, for example. A third of the world's voice minutes goes through Skype. That's all voice minutes, a third of them. We can now communicate looking at somebody, speaking in our native language, and having them see what we're saying in their native language in real time for free. That's available right now. That's changed in a very big way the way we communicate around the world. We even started communicating with objects. We talked about the Internet of Things. From fitness bands to thermostats, people are communicating with an almost equal amount of time with things as they are with people. But we're social, and we're becoming more social. Everything we do has an online element to it, whether it's just emailing a meeting time or we're just setting up, a, setting up a conversation with a friend that you haven't talked to in a while. But if you ask, and if you ask people, teens, tweens, younger people right now, um, are you overstimulated? Do you have, is there too much? Is it really hard for you to engage? Uh, the majority of them, according to research, say, no, this is just, this is just how they behave. This is how they interact. Um, but some of, some of what we knew to be physical interactions are sort of being broken down. In, uh, in what some would say is an unhealthy way. Um, we text people all the time throughout the day, and then by the time we get together with them at night, sometimes there's nothing left to say, because he said it. Um, 
do we overcommunicate? I mean, has, has physical presence really brought us so far away from connecting with people that we're more focused on our devices than the people that we're with? And from autocorrecting, I mean, do, <laughs> do, do emoticons, do emoticons really convey the expressions that we want? Um, are we really expressing ourselves? If over 90% of communication is nonverbal and we expect to understand each other in uh, sentences that are 140 characters or less, um, do we really get the point across? Not always. So we started to switch our focus to images. If an image is worth a thousand words and you have a thousand images, it becomes a pretty big number. Um, you can say that you know, you're sharing your, your feelings are, I'm having a great time, I'm kite surfing. Um, maybe once, maybe you'll say, yeah, this is totally fine. I'm sharing, uh, sharing a picture of all my friends. But you can probably agree that it's starting to be a problem. My feeling is that they have no idea that they're at a football game right now. Um, and we may have forgotten how to experience moments. The last concert I went to, I saw more people watching the concert through their phones than actually watching the concert themselves. And I was wondering, is the concert, is it about, do you go to a concert because you want to tell people you went to the concert, or you go to the concert because you like going to the concert? And um, it becomes this weird sort of, what are we actually talking about? It's this sort of me-centric, like, what, what, what is it about me? Why do I want my name written on a cup? Um, well, it's the concept of personalization, but we're, we're, in, we're in chaos. So that's the history. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of observations that I've seen on how business has changed and how business is evolving because of all this. But in order to do that, I have to give you a little bit of a background, um, a little bit of a background on data, uh, given uh, what I do for a living. So first of all, Technology is not, um, it's not the end, it's not the answer, it's the means, right? Um, it's the clay that we use to create experiences. So take Uber, for example. People were fed up with taxis. They didn't like the smell, they didn't like the bad drivers, they didn't like calling and always saying, well, we're going to be there in five minutes, and they were never there in five minutes. Um, and so the first few rides that you take with your Uber, how many people take Uber? Yeah. Okay, good. So your first few rides with Uber, it was all about, wow, this app is amazing. I can't believe it. But then after you've taken it your first five, six times, it becomes less about the app, because you just expect that to work. I had one of my experiences where it didn't work earlier. It becomes about the experience. It becomes the clean cab. It becomes the conversation with the driver, who hopefully isn't uh, starting too much conversation. It becomes about them giving you water and gum in the car. And that's what differentiates um, the new experience versus the old experience. Technology is just what helps connect people. It's what um, innovators use to solve real problems. So as business evolves, businesses are going to have to focus on that human need. And ultimately, we're all still people, and those experiences matter. So data is the new oil. Data by itself is inert. It doesn't provide any value. It just sits in a database, and it doesn't, doesn't move. It doesn't do anything. What you need to do is you need to extract value from it. You extract value from that data by analyzing it. So analytics is like the new drilling, trying to get insight out of all that data that we're accumulating from the Internet of Things, from our interactions, from what the social networks are saving uh, from us. And these, this data um, is everywhere, because everything we do leaves a digital trace. Everywhere you go, your phone is tracking where you go. And, we can talk about security and all those other things. This is just, this is just reality, and it's not going away. Um, big data, which a lot of people talk about, um, is just our ability to understand and analyze and interpret this large amount of data that's growing and growing and growing um, using huge servers and um, data centers around the world. So and just, in, just to help you wrap your head around the numbers, I mean, 90% of the world's data anywhere was created in the last two years. And that's going to continue over and over and over again. We're creating enormous amounts of data. Um, it's coming from places like this. Every minute of every day, there are millions of likes, millions of Skype minutes. It's just ever, never ending. And so what, what all this data is good for, though, is personalization. 
So here's the most rudimentary form of personalization. You get an email from a company and it says, hi, and they include your name. That's using data. You may say that that's pretty standard. Well, it wasn't just a few years ago, right? You used to get dear user or something. Um, so the, the future, the, the, the future that, we, that we're going to use data for is really about personalization. The way, you, the way that you make that happen is by collecting it, integrating it, and creating some type of profile where you store information about um, what you want to accomplish. So every industry has to evolve. So take uh, on, the data, on the data stream, take about advertising, old advertising. Companies used to yell at us, right? They'd have these big billboards, and they'd just throw out as much as they could and hope it sticks. Right? If you put up a billboard in Brooklyn, you'd put a picture of a guy with a beard and tight jeans. You'd say he's a hipster, and he'd market whatever he is to the local people in Brooklyn, and you'd hope that it worked. Um, but then uh, companies started to tailor their content. So they decided, all right, I want to sell cigarettes to women. So they put a filter on it, and they, and they put a picture of a woman. They said, OK, we're now mar marketing toward women. Um, and Ads reflected societal tone. Um, the ad companies were just trying to push back to us what they thought people really felt. Um, but it evolved, and companies structured themselves in, in a different way, and the modern advertising was born. So this was the whole concept of Mad Men, right? We were gathering data, we had focus groups, we collected this data, and we used it um, to create more personalized experiences. Um, it was a more structured approach. And when the web developed, the web did sort of the same thing, right? It started in sort of the same way. You had these banner ads where they would just take anything that was usually very unapplicable, and they would just throw it at you. And not very many people liked banner ads. Um, so the way that we resolve that is through the cookie. The cookie is a very simple concept that sort of developers use within a site where they can Remember where you were when you left off, so when, they come back, when you come back, um, your username is still there, your theme, your preferences, your filters. Um, this was the concept of personalization that was beginning. Um, online ads have more data points, they're more scientific, they provide more value. Um, because essentially, if you're in a Facebook chat and you have to see an ad, and we all know Facebook's not free, right? It's paid for by the ads that you see. If you're in a Facebook chat and you're talking about how you're in New York City and you're hot, you have a choice. You can Either get an ad that's pertinent and relevant that may add value to you, like six ways to stay cool in New York City, or you can get something for adult diapers. It'll be one of the two. Um, personalization is the one that's going to give you the one that, um, that actually provides value. So this era of personalization um, is, is all about getting rid of the noise. People don't want noise because there's so much coming at them. We have to filter out all that content that doesn't really add uh, that doesn't really add to the experience. And the best at this right now is Netflix. So 75% of the things that people watch on Netflix come through the personalization engine. That's the saying, that's the, that's the part that says, people like you like this, or why don't you take a look at this, or the, the top movies that are in the front section. On Amazon, 35% of their sales come from their suggestions. So people want choice, though. When you sign up for Netflix, one of the first things that people ask is, well, how many movies do they have in their database? It's sort of irrelevant because you only watch a sliver of them. Most of them are junk anyway. Um, that's why Netflix is very impressive. They use, they use data. They use data to create, um, to create an experience that's relevant to you. And with, with the concept of push notifications, people expect that they're going to be told, hey, 10 of your friends just watched this movie and they liked it. You should go watch it too. It shouldn't be any more about you having to know, hmm, maybe I should ask what movie I should watch. So personalization also leads to new products. When people ask you what type of coffee you like, most people respond by saying, I like a dark, thick, heavy, roast Italian coffee. Um, but what Starbucks did is they created a loyalty program, and they tracked what people were buying, and then they opened their eyes, and they looked at what people were actually doing. And they were loading up that really heavy, rich, dark coffee with milk and sugar. And what they realized is that what people really want is smooth, creamy uh, coffee. So they created a brand. And it became one of their best-selling coffees overnight. Because they created a personalized experience based upon data. And it's not just a coffee thing. 
Go back to Netflix. Netflix knows when you rewind, when you fast forward, when you actually watch something to the end, when you skip through, and then when you rate that you loved it even though you didn't. They know that. And so what they're able to do is they're create, able to create a TV series from scratch based upon everything that people say that they like and, what, and based upon their actual behaviors that becomes an instant hit overnight. And so what we're seeing is that um, consumers get the content that they crave, right? And it's all based upon analytics. Netflix wins. It's a win-win for everybody. But it's based on analytics. That's the key here. Um, data analytics are the foundation for innovation. It goes back to something from a long, long time ago. Um, Steve Jobs said that if he listened to what everybody told him, he would have never invented the iPod. Um, and so analytics, drilling for data um, to try and figure out what people really want is going to be the determining factor between success and failure for companies uh, moving forward. There's also this concept that um, many of you may have heard about is this, uh, this concept of the desire for authenticity. So authenticity is about transparency and integrity. And you want to you wanna associate yourself with a brand or a company that comes through that, um, that stands for a lot of these values. Um, you want your government to be authentic. But what governments have and what a lot of companies have is the concept of a spin doctor. And their role um, is to control the way, um, the way a message is conveyed and control the way the world sees what's actually happening. It's the opposite of authenticity. Now, they're important, and they're not going to go away. But this is, a, this is a, very, a very important concept that's slowly getting deconstructed as people have more and more access to information. Um, because the individual now has a voice, and they have a means to communicate. And so where it used to be the responsibility of like, the Better Business Bureau or, uh, or news agencies to go and find the roots of problems and expose it, um, now it's really the individuals. Because if we go back to the concept of bloggers you have and whistleblowing, an individual person can disrupt governments. They can, they can disrupt the flow of money. They can disrupt the world. Um, and they can affect the reputation of brands overnight. So we're looking for authenticity and truth, and when we don't find it, people go on the offense very, very quickly. We saw very recently Volkswagen. They have billions of dollars wiped off, wiped off their books and huge tarnish of reputation because those who break the code of authenticity now have to, have to be able to be absolutely certain that they'll never get found out because it's so easy these days to out people that aren't telling the truth. It's an important balancing act. So we have this concept of innovation versus improvement. Um, this is, a, this is a, an adage that has been used many times. Um, but essentially, innovation is creating something absolutely new. And optimization is taking something that was created and making it better. So the question is, which is important? Which is more important? And the answer is neither. Uh, neither is more important, because um, they're, both, they're, they're actually both essential. If you take a look at the original use of Coke, right? it was to treat hang hangovers and anxiety. It was a very little known product, and it didn't do very well. But when it was used for soda, it was the most popular soda in the world. Um, this was a hypertension and angina treatment. And now it's used for fun. And it's, uh, and it's a huge, huge, huge success. That's optimization. It's taking something that was created, that was innovated, and then using it for other things. Um, now, innovation is a little bit more sexy. It's more sexy because you can use fun pictures and fun graphics. And Silicon Valley is all about in innovation. And there's millions of dollars being poured in, billions of dollars. Um, optimization is a little less exciting. You have feels like Six Sigma process. I'm part of that world. I kind of like it. Um, it, uh, it, takes, it takes rethinking. Um, it takes seeing beyond, beyond what already exists, something that may be created, to try and figure out how you can, be, how you can make it applicable. Um, so I couldn't find a chart, uh, so I drew my own. That's why the, uh, 
the handwriting's horrible. My, uh, my parents have been telling me that for a very long time, actually. Um, but our ability to innovate has been increasing exponentially for years. That's what it says, the rise for innovation. Our, our rate of adoption hasn't been increasing at the same rate. Now it's starting. And the gap between those two curves, that's change management. And so what's happening now is that the, general, uh, the generational gaps are becoming more and more apparent. Um, people, uh, people were not able to absorb the amount of technology that was being thrown at us. But now, with younger generations growing up, uh, millennials in the workforce, which we'll talk about, people are able to absorb a lot of this technology a little bit better. And they're pushing back into the economy the innovation that's going to create even more. So I think that our ability to adopt all this stuff and just incorporate it in our lives is going to get a little bit, um, a little bit easier as time goes on. Um, innovation and optimization, right? Take Tesla. Uh, Tesla innovated with the introduction of the Tesla Model S. That was a huge change. But they leveraged the concept that was very old of Windows Update from Microsoft that had been around for a decade, right? You'll now be driving in your car, and updates will be sent, and you'll have the most up-to-date maps. They will be able to alter the timing of your pistons to improve your gas mileage if they see that you're driving in a way that needs to be uh, optimized. Um, it's about blending the two of innovation and optimization together that creates a brand that people have real loyalty to. And if you look at um, Tesla right now, we'll talk about it later on, they have 400,000 orders, pre-orders, for uh, their new Tesla Model 3. There's never been anything seen like that with a car company ever in history. But companies have to watch out for doing the wrong balancing act, right? So this was optimization only. This was Windows Phone. They were the first. They were there way before the iPhone. Um, Microsoft launched a smartphone, and it appeared right around the same time as the Blackboard, the Blackberry, and it totally failed. And why did it fail? And this is really important for any business professional to know. Um, if you look closely, it has a lot of the old stuff, right? It has a little X in the corner, just like Windows does. It had a start menu. It has a scroller bar. That didn't make any sense to have in the palm of your hand. All they did was they optimized something that they had already created and hoped that it would work. And it was an epic failure. There was a lot of epic failures with companies that just tried to optimize without innovating. Has anybody even used the Amazon Fire Phone? <laughs> it was designed so that at any point in time, whatever you see, you could hit a button and buy it. And Amazon just sort of assumed that everybody wanted to buy everything all the time. Um, Cheetos created a lip gloss. That one didn't do very well. Harley Davidson thought that they were being innovative, and they strayed from making motorcycles to making cologne. That one didn't last very long. It, uh, it actually smelled like leather. Um, so it's important that when companies go and try and innovate, that they don't stray too far from their core. You don't want to go too far from what you're good at, what you're known for, what you know that you can really produce. But you have to try. And now that technology is so inexpensive and so readily available to everybody, you can fail fast. You can fail often. And you can fail very cheaply. When the Amazon phone failed, it sort of just died. The expectation was, OK, they, they tried. It failed. No big deal. And their stock price went up. Um, the stock price went up when they launched it. And then the stock price went up again when they dropped it. Who knew? They spent over a billion dollars building that phone. But the deal was that if you fail fast and you fail gracefully and you bow out and you say, OK, this didn't work, um, that's, that's OK. That's, that's what it's like today. So we have to say, so why are startups so successful? Why is it that any kid in their garage, garage, garage can go put uh, a large company out of business? I'm confused to having moved back here. Um, we'll take Level. Level is a simple budgeting app. Right? They do one thing beautifully and very, very well. They take your income minus your spending, and that tells you what you're saving. That's it. There's no bells, no whistles, no nothing. You connect it to all of your bank accounts, so it has everything that comes in. And, uh, and you get a clear picture of what your budget is. There's no clutter. 
A lot of companies have tried that. Um, Mint.com was the first to do this. But what did they do? They immediately tried to upsell and cross-sell. And they put all these different features. And when you log in, it tells you all the different things that you can buy. Um, but that's not really what people wanted. They want simplicity. They want it to be easy to use. And they want to get what they want when they open it. Um, so if you're a legacy company, what do you do? If you've been around for a long time, and you've got these very complex systems, and you've got this heavy infrastructure and heavy architecture and all these different silos that don't talk to each other, like a bank as an example. Well, here's what companies are doing. Reuters is opening up an innovation lab in Waterloo in the next few months. GE has innovation labs. Coca-Cola has innovation labs. What they're doing is they're taking low capital investment, they're building something on the side, and they're saying, hey, let's take our brightest from every little group, put them together and say, all right, if you weren't stuck with all that nonsense that you have, how would you do it? And build it, and build a prototype, and see if it works. If it fails, it fails. No big deal. At least we tried. So companies are opening these labs everywhere, and the smartest companies are doing that. Um, GE, which was known for being this Six Sigma heavy process, I make trains company, is selling like wildfire all of its physical assets. They're becoming a software company, because they know that this is the direction that the world is headed. So the last, last observation is about talent, and it's about leaders, and it's about people. Um, so who are building our futures? Is it the CEOs of today? Um, I don't necessarily think so. When I, uh, I came here to go see the CEO of Via Rail last week, and what he said was, he doesn't, he's a lawyer. He doesn't really know that much about trains. What he said is he just hires really, really great people to innovate and come up with great ideas. And his job is to just coordinate and make sure that it works. Um, so our future is really this whole concept of the millennials. Millennials are people born between ish 77 to ish 2000. Um, and they are the biggest generation since the baby boomers. And they're going to outnumber the baby boomers by 2022. That's a huge generation. I'm part of it. There's a number of people in this room that are part of it. Um, some that aren't, don't worry. Um, What's our first reaction when we want to look something up or do some research? Our reflex is, let's go find it right away. It's Google, right? We go to YouTube. We do how-to videos. We go to Wikipedia. We try and find what we want immediately because we want to know the answer. Bless you. And we want to know many different varieties of that answer. So we are people who may have never had cable TV. The last time that I had cable TV was when I left my parents' house. Um, and a long time ago. Um, a lot of kids may not even know what it is to, to have to go there and see commercials. Like commercials. Just. Most of what we read uh, as millennials comes from our network. It's a network of links between people. I want to know what my friends are reading because I don't have time to go and try and figure out what's important. I want to go on aggregators that are going to go and take all the best of the news that's out there, according to my taste, and tell me what I'll be interested in. I don't want to have to go to Fox and ABC and NBC and CTV and CBC. There's just, there's just too much. I'm not interested in the noise. We're, um, we're people that use the same tools for work and for play. There's no barriers. We store, we retrieve, we find information. We want to be able to interact at work the same way we interact uh, at home. We want to be able to save something to Dropbox at home that we were working on overnight because we thought it was a great idea, access it at work, and continue doing what we were doing. Um, we believe in, uh, people, people talk a lot about work-life balance, right? I want to make sure that I work during the day and then I have my free time at night. And millennials do not believe in that at all. We believe in work-life integration. It means that when I go to the doctor's office, I can be sitting there at 2 o'clock, which is in the middle of my work day, and I can choose, instead of reading Time Magazine, I can bang out a whole bunch of emails on my device. I'm still working. And to me, that's, that's integration. That's what work life should be. Um, we're part of a different economy. We don't want ownership. Ownership is the market economy. That's the old economy. You have 10 people on a street, and all 10 people have their own snowblower. That is not how millennials work. Millennials want a share economy. We want to be able to go and share with our friends and see who liked it and who didn't like it. It's the concept of Uber, right? And that's why the majority of Uber users are of the millennial generation. We're social. We want to work collaboratively. 
We like to develop relationships with colleagues, and we also want to be casual. We're not the type of people who are going to show up to work in a suit and tie. We just can't handle it. Um, we want to be able to work remotely without the limits of, of old technology and things like the VPN, because we're digital natives. We showed up with this world, and we had technology with us right from the start. And if you show up at a company, and your employer doesn't have Wi-Fi, and they give you a computer with Windows XP, you can absolutely lose your mind. Trust me. <laughs> um, we don't believe in hardcore hierarchy. Um, we don't believe in the concept of having one boss. We're interested in a matrix. I want to work for many people. I want a whole bunch of people to be giving me feedback all the time and giving me opportunities. Um, we want feedback often. We want it in real time because we want to get better. The feedback is about getting better. It's not about not being confident in who we are. We want to see growth trajectory. We want to know what we're working toward, because if we're not working towards something, then why work at all? Um, maybe there's a, it's a difference of a gap between what we bring and what we think we bring. Maybe that gap is there. But, um, but over time, as millennials mature and they spend more time in the workforce, they're going to get better at what they do. So Google got it right. Google got it right, right from the start. They created an environment where people can be creative, where they can have opportunities to share their ideas, they can get work done, they can have food, they can work out, they can take a nap, they can have workspaces, this sounds like all the fun stuff. But you know what's happening? Google employees are more productive than, some, than most employees from any other company in the world. And the top graduates from the top universities want to go work there. They compete to go work there. So if you provide a great atmosphere and you provide a great place for people to go and spend their time. They'll spend more time there. They'll devote more time. They'll have more loyalty, and you'll get the best people. It's just reality. So how do you prepare students to enter the workforce? This is what um, education looks like. See? Um, it's, it's knowledge going one way. It's a slightly different layout. Um, is what, was, was what education has created over time. But basically, there hasn't been much innovation in education since the printing press. Um, that was fine when the workforce was all about somebody telling you what to do. Um, but as the workplaces evolve, um, where it's more about uh, engaging and trying to find solutions together, um, we need a different style. So schools tried to bring in technology. They had the computer room, right? And then they added computers to desks and classrooms. But that's not really it. Um, we're basically just taking a, like an old structure and trying to optimize on it, when what's really needed is innovation. And that's why we start to see more of these. You see people that are feeling, and this uh, Concordia is never going to have me come back here. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm not telling you to drop out of college. All I'm saying is the ones that, uh, it used to be that if you didn't fit into the typical school paradigm, um, you would fail out. Now, you have opportunities to leave and to do other different things. So Peter Thiel is an example. He's one of the co-founders of PayPal. He invested in uh, Facebook. For 500K, he bought 10%. So the guy made a little bit of money. He has this thing called the fellowship, where he's paying, he's paying people in university. He's paying people, smart people, $100,000 to drop out of school and come work for his company. And he's going he's gonna to give them better skills and better training than they would have gotten in school. At least that's what he says. And schools are recognizing that. Schools are recognizing that um, the workforce is all about people coming together and communicating and collaborating and trying to solve problems. And you do your reading and your learning on your spare time. When I went to university, I went to class. And that's when we did our reading and our learning and our one-to-one to one, sort of one uh, experience. And then I had to go home and solve problems alone. And that was just not congruent with what it was like day one when I started working. Um, so universities are jumping into it too, right? EDX, you have some of the top universities in the world all coming together, making all of their curriculums free online and allowing people to engage. Um, and so these were providing alternatives to students. So what does the school of tomorrow look like? I don't know. I really don't know. But there's going to be more collaboration, more communication, more screens, more people working together to solve problems during the day. And you'll do your reading elsewhere. Um, if you look at the school of one, right? This is an experimental school. They provided these. They, they put these principles. It's an incubator, and it'll take time. It's in New York City. 
where you have learning labs and you have people able to try and solve problems together uh, in school. And so what remains is that we have, uh, we have to challenge the concept of space, content, assessments, curriculums, the way staffs work. I'm running out of time, but I still have tons to tell you. Um, it's better, you know, Dr. Seuss said that we have to prepare kids at an early age um, to be ready for the future in their, in their future environment, to deal with change, to innovate, to think out of the box, um, to multitask, to work collaboratively and interact uh, with different cultures, um, to be in person and share different ideas, because that's what the real workforce is like. It's this concept of blended learning that I won't go into, but if you're interested, please take a look. So I was going to talk to you about banking. I hope everybody has a little bit more time. Um, but this is what's going on in the banking world. I haven't talked to you at all about me um, or why I'm doing what I'm doing. But yes, I went to, Microsoft, uh, to uh, McGill. I graduated from McGill. I worked at Bombardier for two years in Six Sigma and Process. It was a total whirlwind of difference from what I, what I thought I was going to be getting myself into. And I went to grad school at MIT. And then I spent almost a decade at Microsoft. Microsoft is all about transformation in the future. And in recent years, you can see how the company has really transformed itself. Its stock price is up. Microsoft is growing like crazy. And I lived through a massive transformation. And one of my customers, when I was uh, running a division in Canada, was National Bank. And I saw a company just about to begin transformation, a company that actually really gets it. It was a long time since I'd seen a company that sees that all of these things are changing, where they need to focus on people, they need to focus on the workforce, they need to focus on uh, the environment. Um, and so that's, that's what attracted me there. And so it's important to understand what's happening in banking, because it's going to affect all of us. Um, so just like Uber disrupted uh, taxis and Airbnb disrupted hotels, um, banking doesn't only end-to-end -end food chain either. Um, if you look at traditional banking, I think most people have had this sign-up experience and have seen uh, pages that look like that. Um, there are smaller companies that are making it really simple to sign up to have a really simple, beautiful experience. These, these companies are called fintechs, financial technology companies. And you don't need to raise, raise funds anymore or sell currency or to, or to get a loan. Um, around 15% of payments are now done uh, through alternative means. These are like the core areas of banking. And they're all being disrupted by these different companies scattered all over the place. And so if you were to look at a company's web page, right, a bank's web page, essentially all the things that they offer are being attacked by all these different companies everywhere. And they're sitting there getting fired at. And they're not really sure how to react. So they have to make some decisions, right? FinTech investment is up to $3 billion. It's double the year before. It's double the year before that. From banking to insurance, um, they're getting, banks are getting hit from all areas. So I'll talk to you about something very simple. It's the concept of disintermediation. So let's take payments as an example. Apple Pay. Does anybody use Apple, has anybody used Apple Pay in the US before? The concept of Apple Pay is really simple. It's coming to Canada soon. You take your credit cards, you upload your credit card, and you can pay by tapping. And you use your thumbprint to authenticate yourself instead of your PIN. Super simple. I can go on a run, and I don't need to take my credit cards anymore. So that's great. I mean, it's very convenient. But 88% of the people that use it in the US use the first card that they loaded, because it's the one that remains on top. That's really hard for a bank that wasn't first to market. It becomes really difficult from, from a comp competition perspective. Uber was fine when it was just Uber versus a taxi. But now you can order food, and you can donate to charity through Uber. What does that mean? It means that banks start to lose the intelligence. We can't partner anymore. We can't be there to support our clients in the same way. With Starbucks, you load your money once. You make one big purchase, and then the banks lose track of what you spend your money on, how often, where you are, and they don't have the ability to provide you value the same way that they used to. So we are responding, though. Banks are responding. Um, it used to be that the days of showing up at a, at a wicket and then saying you're closed, or um, we're only open from 10 to 4 on Monday to Friday, but maybe not this Thursday or something, we're going to be closed. Like, that is not going to exist in the future. So what do we have to do to transform? Well, the first thing is we can't respond to fintechs like Chevy responded to Tesla. It's not about optimization. It's about innovation. Because we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking that we use to get ourselves where we are today. So a couple of things are happening. We're either, banks are either buying fintechs or partnering with fintechs, or um, 
They're acquiring parts of the technology, but essentially all banks are putting themselves in their client's shoes, and you can see it across, uh, across the entire industry. And so we're doing something. We're focusing on a digital and a physical transformation. We believe um, as a bank that the physical interaction is still important, but we can make that physical interaction a lot better if we digitize things. It shouldn't be that you have to fill out 10 forms, write your name a whole bunch of times. You can digitize that stuff. Um, and so you're going to start seeing new, beautiful experiences, right? You're going to see huge touchscreen touch ATMs. Imagine going to the Bell Center, and instead of waiting in line to go, go through that ATM queue, you do your transaction on your phone, and then you tap your phone on a kiosk and take your money. Imagine how fast that line would go, right? So you're going to start seeing that type of transformation. Um, you're going to see beautiful experiences for a branch if you ever have to go into it. Now, I'm not going to give away any more of the, like, the secret stuff that's coming. Um, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of other banks, but, but banks are listening. The deal is that um, life is built around a collection of moments, right? Your first car, graduation, marriage, having a kid. Um, in those moments, it's not about buying the car. Uh, sorry, it's not about getting a lease. It's about buying a car. It's not about taking out the line of credit to fund college. It's about going to college. Um, and so we have to be there for, banks have to be there for the moments that are most important for people. And, you're, and we need to be there to provide advice. Um, entry level guidance is if you want to buy a graduation gown, you can either buy it on your credit card with a high interest rate, or we could tell you, you know what, we can give you a line of credit at a lower rate. Um, a better idea is, help, is your advisor giving you, taking a look at all of your financials and telling you what, you what you can afford and what you can't afford and how you should go about it, doing it. But advice, like real advice, is you tell your advisor, you know what, I'm going to be going to college soon, I'm going to be moving in with a college roommate, and your advisor says, you know what, we should, do a cohabit we should give you a cohabitation agreement. We should give you a joint bank account. We should help you uh, on your life journey. It's all about substance. I'm almost done here. Um, because successful disruption comes from the experience, not the technology. We learned that earlier. Uber was not about the app as much as it is about the gum and the, and the, and the water. Um, both Tesla and Uber figured out about how to disrupt. So we have all these approaches, right? We're going to focus on innovation. We're going to build an exciting work environment. We're going to focus on people. And we're going to keep the client at the center of everything that we do. So just to wrap up, um, there was a time when things were simple. It was simple, but it was inefficient. But when it was inefficient, we still had really strong relationships with our friends. Um, and then we were able to travel around the world and see and experience different things at the click of a button using our social networks. Um, and we might be overstimulated, but we can reasonably say with a certain level of confidence that in this chaos, um, we're getting used to it and we're going to emerge. Because it's really nice when an Uber can arrive in five minutes and when everybody knows how to do it, everybody will be more comfortable. And sooner or later, we're going to have smart houses and everything's going to be connected and all of that data is going to flow in a really seamless way. But pers personalization is going to help us cut through all the noise. And businesses and government have to adapt to those pressures, and individuals have to stay open, and they have to adapt as well. Um, because the, different, the gap between the need and the have is starting to slowly close as more data, digital and data is available to people. Um, and so these are some of the go-dos that, that I was thinking, that it's OK to fail if you fail fast. Um, trust your gut and the noise. Speak the language of technology. Don't say no. Don't try and not learn. Just learn. Spend some time on it. And understand what personalization means, because it's what your customers really want. Stay true to who you are, and, and make sure that you don't deviate from that and make uh, Cheetos flavored lip gloss. And your career is a soundboard, right? Turn the volume up in some areas, turn it down, turn it up in other areas, turn it down. But there's no reason to stay in one industry. You can move around and you can experience new and different things. And the, and the new normal is that there is no more normal. You have to be comfortable with change. So my ask of you is to be agents of change and be ambassadors of change and think about how you are going to be um, are affected by technology and how you can make the world a better place with it. Um, and think about how you'll go about doing it. Thanks. <laughs>